You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can in the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank and a member of DIC. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary. To the sweetest girl I know. Hello everyone and welcome to History of the Great War, episode 179. We have spent many episodes discussing the war in 1918, but this week we take some time to discuss another event that would begin to sweep over the world in 1918, the Great Influenza Pandemic. While it did not involve the battlefield, it would be partially caused and inflamed by the war and the actions of those countries that were fighting in the war. The story of the influenza begins in the United States, and it would then travel over the Atlantic with American troops. Once it had jumped over the ocean, it would begin to circle the entire globe, carried to all continents by troop transports and other ships. There would be multiple waves of the influenza that would cross back and forth over the face of the earth, with the first wave beginning in the spring of 1918. This would be the most mild form of influenza, and it would find its primary victims in the armies of those that were fighting in the war. The second wave would arrive in early autumn, and it would be by far the most deadly. This second wave would be the real killer, and the most impactful around the world as it moved from country to country in late 1918 and early 1919. The third wave would come later, but it would be a step down from the second wave in terms of mortality rate, although it would still kill thousands. It is very likely that these three waves were all the same virus, just a mutated version of it, although it's possible that they were different viruses that overlapped and interacted with one another. This episode will start with just a bit of a refresher on what influenza is, and how it's caught by humans. We will then follow the 1918 outbreak of the influenza from its roots, which were probably at a United States Army camp in Kansas, to the Western Front, and then to the civilian populations all around the world. Next episode, we will spend a bit more time looking at the pandemic around the world, and then look at the total cost of the most deadly pandemic in human history. Influenza is a virus that did not initially originate in humans, but instead in birds. The influenza that exists in birds looks nothing like what it does in humans, though, and for it to jump species, and then to also be infectious to other humans, requires it to mutate. These mutations come in different forms every time the virus makes a jump, and sometimes they only happen because it goes through a different species first, like pigs, and they're a frequent vector for these mutations, and the move from pigs to humans is generally easier, and it arrives in a far more deadly state. These types of movements and mutations still happen today, and when it does, drastic steps are sometimes taken to prevent the spread of the disease. For example, in 1997, when a virus was found in humans in Hong Kong, six people would die, and every single chicken in Hong Kong, all 1.2 million of them, would be killed. In 2003, a similar incident would happen in Europe, and 30 million poultry and pigs would be killed. In both of these cases, the virus was given a designation, H5N1 and H7N7, respectively. And this type of designation is still used today, and will be familiar to anyone who frequently watches the news. It seems like there's a new flavor of the influenza every year with this HN designation. For those who are wondering, like I was, what these letters and numbers mean, according to the CDC, these HN designations are ways to tell which flavor of influenza is being discussed. Quote, Influenza A viruses are divided into subtypes based on two proteins on the surface of the virus, the hemagglutinin, the H, and the nermidinase, uh, the N. There are 18 different hemagglutin subtypes and 11 different neuraminidase subtypes. Oh, that's hard. Uh, 
H1 through H18, and N1 through N11, respectively. In all of these cases, drastic steps are, are generally taken to prevent the spread of a deadly type of the flu, in many cases to prevent situations like what happened in 1918 from happening again. Now, when people talk about flu, flu shots, risk of epidemics, 1918 really is kind of the worst case scenario of a disease like the influenza because it could not be contained or even really treated. The flu in 1918 was different than most. It caused pneumonic complications, which is often what killed its victims, not just the flu itself. This pandemic would also occur in a world where flu vaccines were not widely available, and so all that could be done was to try and help the victims with less technologically advanced treatments, like warm water, warm blankets, fresh air, really just nursing, not technology, was the only thing that could be done in the vast majority of cases. There were attempts to make a vaccine, though, and there were already vaccines for many different diseases, and antitoxins and serums available for other ailments. These types of treatments were combined to make things like tetanus, dysentery, diphtheria, cholera, all of them were treatable. But creating a vaccine was a challenge, and it took time. And that was something that the scientists in 1918 did not have. It also took time to determine what this new sickness was, where it came from, and how to treat it, and how it was changing. Trying to find the answers to these questions would lead the medical community down several different treatment paths, most of them dead ends, and the changes to the influenza over time would prevent any treatment from being broadly applicable. All of this is getting a bit ahead of our story, though. We need to go back to the beginning, where the pandemic began, which was probably in Kansas, in the middle of the United States. We're not completely certain that the pandemic began in Kansas, specifically at Camp Funston, which was a United States Army training camp in Haskell County, Kansas. What we do know is that in the last week of February, a group of men traveled to the camp, and in that camp, the first documented cases of influenza were recorded in early March. At this point, it probably looked a lot like uh, many other sicknesses, which were almost inevitable when thousands of men were gathered together at army training camps all over the country, many of which were already overcrowded. However, by the end of March, things began to develop rapidly, and it became clear that something different was happening. By the end of March, 1,100 men at Funston had come down sick and 237 had died. This was a time with so many men being trained for the army that there was an almost constant stream of personnel moving between camps, and that is how the disease began to spread. By the middle of March, there were already reported cases in Georgia, with 10% of two camps in that state reporting sick by the end of the month. Once it had started moving to other camps, it simply became impossible to stop, and while it would move all over these army camps for the rest of the year, it also began to move overseas. With tens of thousands of American troops heading to Europe every month during 1918, the jump overseas was inevitable. It would first be reported in a French army base near Paris on April 10th, around the same time that it would also be reported in British camps. The first cases would be reported by Parisian civilian hospitals in late April. The disease would quickly pass to almost all of the units on the Western Front and in the civilian areas behind the front. Again, this was just inevitable, given the thousands and thousands of people constantly moving around for military purposes. By May, the French were becoming very concerned and ordered that all cases of the outbreak be directly communicated to a central authority. By that point, it had also passed over to the German army, which had its first recorded cases in late April. German soldiers called it Flanders fever, since it seemed to happen more frequently in units in the northern end of the German front. Ludendorff would write after the war that, quote, It was a grievous business, having to listen every morning to the chiefs of staff's recital of the number of influenza cases and their complaints about the weakness of their troops. Remember that this would be at the point where the Germans were trying to launch their war-winning offensives, which were already costing enough men without having to consider the toll of the flu, which was just destroying the German army's ranks. While it was being passed around the armies in France, the flu would also continue to make its way around the world. It would appear in Portugal and in Greece, and by July it was all over the British Isles. By June, it was wreaking havoc on the German home front, where many were already weakened by malnutrition. By the end of May, it was in Shanghai, where one observer would say, quote, it swept over the whole country like a tidal wave. It would jump over to Australia and New Zealand in August. In Sydney, 30% of the population would be sick. One country that I have not yet mentioned, purposefully, is Spain. 
Spain turns into a special case, not because of the specifics of the epidemic in that country, but instead the name that we now associate with the pandemic as a whole, the Spanish flu. As far as modern scholarship can determine, the pandemic was not at all Spanish in nature, nor did the Spanish play much of a role in spreading it around the world. However, Spain had one feature that many other countries in the war did not, and that was very little censorship in the press. In many countries that were actively participating in the war, the press was heavily controlled and heavily censored. But in Spain, a neutral country, those controls did not exist. This meant that when reports of the flu began in newspapers, they were newspapers in Spain. This was the first public acknowledgement of the sickness, and that it was real, and that it was widespread, and that it was deadly. The Spanish claimed that the disease came from the battlefields of Western Europe, but everyone else just started calling it the Spanish flu, believing that it had started in the country since it was where the first reports were made known. I've tried to steer clear of calling it the Spanish flu since that is an incorrect name, and I will continue to try and steer clear of that, but I may mess up a few times. I think it's generally confusing to use names like that, and in general causes too much confusion when the influenza pandemic was not Spanish at all. So why call it Spanish flu? The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com slash GW50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between. Between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. <laughs> The flu pandemic would spread all around the globe, but before it got there, it would first spread all over the ships of the American Navy. The Navy would, at its peak, have 40% of its personnel down with influenza during 1918, and while for much of this time the mortality rate would not be very high, the mortality rate would peak in September. During this time, there would be over 4,000 deaths from flu or complications caused by the flu. This meant that almost twice as many sailors died from the flu as did from German actions during the entire course of American involvement in the war. While it was bad for the sailors in some ways, it was worse for the troops that were being transported over to Europe. The ships turned into death traps for many troops, with September and October being the worst. During some weeks, the number of deaths among the transports were higher than what the American troops were suffering during the Meuse-Argonne Offensive. Things were so bad that Wilson considered stopping all troop transports, In a while it was close, but this action was never taken. There was some concern that stopping the transports would worry the American populace too much, and make it seem like there was a big problem, which there was, but officially, 
it was not being treated like a big problem. There were many attempts to mitigate the effects of the flu on the ships. One change was simply to give the troops better equipment for the trip. As the weather began to turn after the summer of 1918, there was initially not enough cold weather gear for the troops being sent over the oceans. This was remedied in the hopes that it would reduce the effects of the flu, but it did not greatly change the situation. Experiments were also conducted to see whether it would be better to reduce the number of men on each ship, uh, but this did not seem to greatly change the rate of sickness either. Attempts were made to weed out as many sick men as possible before they got on the boat, but due to the incubation period on the disease, even this had limited utility. On board the ships, there were also attempts by medical personnel to quarantine and treat the sick soldiers, but this was also mostly unsuccessful. In total, thousands of troops would die either on their journey over the Atlantic at Halifax where many sick men were offloaded, or just days after arriving in Europe. One of the interesting features of this first wave of the influenza, which would happen in, you know, midsummer 1918, was not how deadly it was, but instead how not deadly it was, especially when compared with later outbreaks. During the earliest outbreaks in Europe, which were roughly in June and July, only a few men who caught the flu actually died, even though thousands would get sick. For example, out of 600 American troops that were admitted to the hospital, only one would die. For the Royal Navy, 10,000 sailors would fall ill, but only four would die. In France, 200,000 British soldiers would get sick, but only a few of them would die. This is very different than what would happen with later outbreaks, which is when most of the casualties would occur. In fact, at the front, the epidemic began to wane in July, and things seemed to be going back to normal. This would prompt the British Army Command to declare that the problem was over by August 10th. But while the armies believed that the worst was behind them, on the civilian front, the situation was beginning to get bad. While there was optimism at the front in August that the worst was in the past, throughout September and until the end of the war, the second wave of the epidemic would hit the armies like a tidal wave. It is sometimes hard to get exact numbers in these situations, especially for more mild cases, uh, like what was prevalent during the summer months. For men at the front lines, it was often the case that only the most severe cases would be allowed to come off the line, especially during these offensives, which is what the Allies were launching in September and October. This almost certainly depressed the number of frontline troops that would report with the flu, and it meant that there were far more cases reported in troops that were stationed behind the front. In the French army, there was a drastic difference between the two groups, with rear echelon troops having a sickness rate up to 12 times higher than those at the front. The unfortunate truth is that those frontline units probably had more men die than necessary from the disease. In many cases, men would stick with their units either because they did not want to be separated from them or due to patriotism or or a variety of other reasons. And this meant that these men, while they endured at the front longer, would be hit hard by pneumonia in an environment that was ill-prepared to help them. While the disease was spreading at the front, it was also spreading around on the home front, and everywhere it would have its effects, even if they were frequently different from one area to another. In mid-July, it would make its first visit to London, with many other cities around England reporting cases at roughly the same time. In mid-August, the flu would jump onto the African continent at Freetown, Sierra Leone. I'm going to focus on this city not because it's exceptional, but because it's a good example of how the pandemic spread around the world. So in mid-August, Freetown was a major coaling center for ships that were traveling from Europe to the Far East. On the 15th of that month, a troop transport, the HMS Mantua, arrived with hundreds of sick troops on board, all suffering from influenza. The men who loaded the coal on board the ship then caught the flu while on board, and they transported it back to their houses. Soon, the groups of men who coaled the ships were decimated by the disease. Once it had spread around Freetown, it then made the jump back from the civilians to the military, like on the transport the HMS Chepstown Castle, which was on its way from New Zealand to Europe. The ship would stop in Freetown for coal, and over the next three weeks, 900 of the 1,150 men on board would come down with the flu, and 38 would die. All over the world, anywhere that the war touched in any way, ports, river transports, roads, rails, they were all conduits for the disease to spread, and spread it did. Perhaps the quickness of the spread of the disease is the best example of how far the war affected the entire world. The war touched everything, 
and so did the disease that had spread. While the disease was spreading around the world in August, something was becoming apparent. The disease had changed. It was far more deadly this time. The second wave of the influenza would move around the world, starting in ports like Freetown, or Brest in France, or Boston in the United States, and from these ports it would spread all around the globe. The second wave of the disease would be far more deadly to those who caught it, and it would be far more widespread among the civilian societies around the globe. Its movements and effects will be the topic for our next episode. I hope you will join me.